As clever as they are, a lot of the work that scientists do is guesswork. They might have a vague idea about what something is or how it works, and they develop a theory based on that idea. The theory then holds until someone proves them wrong. Scientists are to be admired, but they don't have universal answers for everything. All the things you're about to see in this video proved to be puzzling for the scientists that examined them. The old Hellfire Club in Dublin, Ireland was always said to be haunted by those who spent any extended length of time there. In 2016, archaeologists might have found the cause of all those ghost stories. What was once thought to be a natural mound of earth on the land next to the club turned out to be a burial mound atop an ancient tomb, and the tomb runs directly beneath the Hellfire Club. Experts say that the burial is about 5,000 years old. Hellfire Club was built in 1725, and it now seems likely that its builders used stones from the passage tombs beneath the land without telling anybody. The roof collapsed shortly after the club was built, and thus began a long-lived local rumor that the building itself was evil. A mysterious fire forced the permanent abandonment of the club in the late 18th century, and a 250-year-old body clutching a statue of Satan was found buried on the grounds during the 1970s. The identity of the occupant of the original tomb remains unknown, but perhaps they took exception to their long rest being disturbed by the antics inside the club. Scientists and historians are slowly beginning to accept that Neanderthals were capable of far more than we've credited them with in the past. They've had to accept that because of discoveries like these ring structures inside the Brunichel cave in France's Aveyron Valley. Based on the evidence at the scene, the artificial structures were created 176,000 years ago. That rules out early humans and leaves Neanderthals as the most likely candidates for their creation. The entrance to the cave was sealed up by a landslide thousands of years ago, but a 15-year-old boy spent the summer of 1990 clearing up the entrance because of sheer curiosity about what might be inside. To his amazement, he found broken stalagmites carefully arranged into two large rings, one 12 feet across and another 20 feet across. Piles of burnt animal bones were found within both rings. That means the Neanderthals were also capable of creating fire. The purpose of the rings will almost never be known, but they suggest at the very least that Neanderthals were capable of either abstract thought, ritualistic behavior, or both. In a very similar vein, our next incredible find is a 50,000-year-old needle that was found in a cave in Siberia in August 2016. Once again, archaeologists and scientists are positive that the needle wasn't made by Homo sapiens, which leaves us with very few alternative candidates. We're not looking at the Neanderthals this time, though. We're looking to the Denisovans, a mysterious human-like race who seem to have lived in and around a Denisova cave, but didn't spread to any other part of the world. There's no doubt that the needle is artificial. It even has a hole for a thread to be passed through it. It's made of animal bone, and it's officially the oldest sewing needle in the world. It's also one of the oldest Denisovan relics, as it's a full 10,000 years older than a polished piece of chlorite Denisovan jewelry that was found elsewhere in the cave a few years earlier. It's thought that the earliest Denisovans arrived at the cave around 170,000 years ago. Scientists aren't sure where they were before they reached the cave, and nor do they know what happened to them after they left. The freezing cold conditions at the bottom of the Baltic Sea are well suited to preserving anything that reaches such depths. That makes it a good place to go looking for shipwrecks, as a team of divers from Finland found out when they discovered this 17th century wreck in September 2020. The design of the ship is consistent with the type of trading vessel used extensively by Dutch merchants during that era. In the Netherlands, ships like these were called flutes, 
The wreck was found close to the mouth of the Gulf of Finland, not far from the easternmost point of the Baltic, at a depth of just under 300 feet. The ship is so well preserved that it ought to be possible to say what sank it, and therein lies the problem. There's no obvious visible damage to the ship that would have caused it to go under. In fact, the worst damage seems to be that done to the upper decks by trawlers passing above the wreck with their nets. The ship's hold is untouched and full of cargo, although none has yet been brought back to the surface. Of all the mummified human bodies in the world, there's none quite so unique as the Grobel Man. He's the most fascinating exhibit in Denmark's Moosgaard Museum, visited by thousands of people every year. You might not think he's too easy on the eyes, but we think he's not doing badly for a man who's 2,300 years old. The body is so well preserved that all of its skin and hair are still present, as are the fingernails. We can thank the peat bog that he spent most of the past two millennia inside for that. He was discovered by workmen digging for peat in 1952. Unsurprisingly, they were terrified by the sight of the body and ran away in fear. In truth, though, Grobel Man had more to fear from people than people did from him. Based on the markings on his body, it seems likely that he was ritually sacrificed before being thrown into the bog. Such practices were common back then, because the ancient residents of Denmark believed that bogs served as portals to the gods and the underworld. By sacrificing this man, they hoped they'd incur the favor of the gods who would bless their efforts to obtain iron ore. If there weren't so many historical accounts from people who saw Greek fire with their own eyes, we probably wouldn't believe it ever existed. Even today, our best scientists aren't sure of its precise recipe. By all accounts, the use of Greek fire is what won a war for the Byzantine Empire in the year 673 at Constantinople. The flames are said to have traveled across the water itself, leaping from ship to ship. All of the Byzantine Empire's enemies tried and failed to make their own versions of Greek fire, and when the empire eventually fell, the secret was lost. Modern-day scientists have hypothesized that it involved a combination of phosphide, sulfur, and quicklime. But there would likely have been other ingredients, and we may never know what they were. Whatever went into the making of Greek fire, it was surely the mightiest weapon in the world at the time. Sailing a fleet out to face the Empire's armies was a risky thing to do if you knew that they could attack you with fire across the water. That's probably one of the reasons that the Empire lasted for as long as it did. The Sea of Galilee boat is sometimes referred to as the Jesus boat. There are those who believe that it might have belonged to and been used by Jesus Christ and his disciples, although there's no hard evidence of that. The boat was found on the shore of the Sea of Galilee in 1986 and dates to the first century. It might not have belonged to Jesus, but it existed when Jesus was alive, and is of the type that he would have used for fishing. The boat is almost 30 feet long and only became visible because of a severe drought. When it was found, it was in such a delicate state that it had to be submerged in a wax bath for 12 years before it was stable enough to go on display to the public. It still contained a cooking pot and a lamp when it was discovered. Both artifacts have been tested and dated to between the years 50 BCE and 50 CE. There's evidence of repeated repair work being carried out on the boat, which suggests that it probably remained in use for several decades. Here's a fact that's almost impossible to comprehend. 1,200 years ago, the Chimu civilization of Peru invented a basic form of telephone. It's not exactly a smartphone, but it's capable of enabling spoken communication across short distances. The Chimu telephone was found in the ruins of Chan Chan in late 2020 and is the only artifact of its kind ever to be found in the country. You might have made something similar to it when you were a child. The telephone is made of a pair of cups, connected by a 70-foot-long cotton twine string. 
We think the cord may have been run between two neighboring houses, or perhaps from one end of a large communal building to the other. Archaeologists can't decide whether it was thought of as a sophisticated device for the use of the elite, or whether it was a simple child's toy. We might never find that out, because the Chimu had no written language, and so they didn't leave behind any records for us to consult. It's not the most high-tech phone you'll ever see, but it would have worked perfectly well. The sooner the ancient rulers of Cairo knew whether there was a flood or a drought coming, the sooner they could start planning for it. That, in a nutshell, is why they built the Nilometer. Looking at the impressive structure, you could easily believe it was a temple or a building of religious importance. And you could argue that it was. There was nothing in Cairo more important to the welfare of the city's people than this at the time it was built. The Nilometer you see in these images is the largest of three that still exist in the Egyptian capital. The stone steps that spiral down the sides of the marble column are there to allow priests to descend to the depths and check on the water level of the Nile. Only priests and the ruling elite were allowed to enter the Nilometer because the status of the Nile was considered to be privileged information 5,000 years ago. The information they gathered would be relayed to the pharaoh, who would then decide policies based on that information. They couldn't avoid a drought, but they could at least start stockpiling goods before the worst effects of one took hold. Not all of the fascinating ancient buildings in Athens, Greece are temples. Take the Tower of the Winds, for example. This 2,200-year-old structure is an ancient Greek weather station. In fact, experts are convinced that it was the first weather station in the world. The tower features a sundial, a weather vane, and a water clock. It's capable of measuring far more than wind, but its name comes from the eight Greek gods of wind, one of whom appears on each of the marble tower's eight faces. The faces of the sundials beneath the friezes have faded over time, but they're still just about visible and still work as the tower's builders intended. The weather vane, however, is mostly ruined. It once featured a bronze statue of Triton, a god of the seas, but he was lost long ago. When Christianity came to Greece, the Tower of the Winds was converted to a church, with the addition of a cemetery outside. It then became a place of worship for Sufi Muslim whirling dervishes during the Ottoman era. After that, it became abandoned, and until refurbishment and restoration work was carried out in the 1830s, so much debris had built up around its base that the tower was half buried. Amateur metal detectorist Buffy Bailey struck lucky in November 2021 when she found a tiny gold Bible in a farmer's field close to York, England. When we say tiny, we really mean it. The delicately engraved Bible is barely bigger than Buffy's fingernail. She immediately took her find to a museum, where professional archaeologists told her that it's around 600 years old and could be worth as much as 100,000 pounds. The artifact could only have been owned by someone of immense wealth, and we might know who. The field the Bible was found in is on land that once belonged to King Richard III, so Buffy's discovery might have a royal connection. The engravings on the visible surfaces of the Bible are representations of St. Margaret and St. Leonard, both of whom are patron saints of childbirth. That makes it likely that the item was given to an expectant woman in the hope that it would protect her during the birthing process. Historians have noted the similar style of this artifact to the Middleham Jewel, which was found not far from here in a place also connected to Richard III. It may even have been made by the same artist. Many of our American viewers will have heard of Gungiwamp in Groton, Connecticut, but knowing it exists and understanding it are two different things. The entire site feels almost like it was designed to be a puzzle for archaeologists, with layers of artifacts piled up on top of each other, seemingly out of chronological order. Over the years, archaeologists have found artifacts from the colonial era inside Neolithic-era burial chambers. 
They've found stone rings on top of the colonial era finds and strange inscriptions etched into the stone that they've never been able to translate. The lack of clarity over who founded the site and when has led to some fantastical claims being made. One story even says that Gungiwamp was founded and settled by Celtic Christian monks who ran away from their Norse persecutors and made it to America during the 6th century. Experts have found direct evidence that the site was founded at least 3,500 years ago. The question of who by might never be answered. Subscribe to the channel, turn on the notification bell, and enjoy watching new videos on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you soon!